cool girl around you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> oh, goodness. So, first of all, good morning, good sir. Good morning. I'd like to introduce um, Lori. Not paying attention back there. That's Lori Lucas. My, my, she's the best horsewoman. Uh, she's been a top quarter horse judge for 22 years all over the world. An old rancher told me that um, after 10 years of marriage, if you want to know how you're getting along, what you do is you take your dog and you put him in the trunk of the car and then you put your wife in the trunk close the lid and drive around for an hour. When you open the trunk, you'll know who loves you the most. <laughs> I was wondering where that was going. <laughs> Wayne Lucas is ninth on the all-time leaderboard in North America with 4,900 wins and fifth on the all-time leaderboard in regards to earnings with over two. 190 million. It's a lot of coin, Wayne. I wonder where that went. 10%? Uh, well. <laughs> you can do the math. I, can't, I don't have any of it. <laughs> <laughs> to me, Wayne is like E.F. Hutton. Every time I hear him speak, I literally cling to every word he says. And if this is the first time that you have had the opportunity to hear Wayne, I highly encourage you to listen very closely. Wayne wrote we don't do we don't do a lot of these free. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I know. I do a better job but they're not free. So exactly, so listen up. A couple of years ago, Wayne wrote a book entitled Sermon on the Mount, and one of the quotes in his book reads, "In horse racing, the good is never as the bad, the good is never as good as the bad is bad. Never give up. And to me, that really sums you up, especially in the last couple of years. Well, you know, they, we're getting paid every day as trainers to make them better. And uh, so a lot of times you'll fool with a horse and you won't get a result on him and you try something else and he won't get the result. A great example of that was Charismatic. When Charismatic was a big grand looking horse with the pedigree to go with it, and as a two-year-old we couldn't get him to even work a decent half mile. We tried this, we tried that, we went back and forth trying to get him to work uh, a decent half a mile. Finally, I called Bob Lewis and I said, I think this one's not going to make it. Let's run him for claim. Oh and uh, Bob said, well, what about 25,000? Well, he gave 400,000 for him. So I said, well, let's, <laughs> let's not get that drastic right now. So we ran him for 62,500 and he won quite impressive. And it surprised my whole staff. All of us thought, where in the hell did that come from? Because he had never shown anything. So we weren't convinced. We ran him back three weeks later for 62.5 with winners, and he won again. Now we're starting. I came down the steps with my son, and I said, we better hope that nobody claimed him because he's starting to wake up. To shorten up the story, he goes from 62.5 claim getting his confidence to the Derby win, to the Preakness win, runs in the, uh, the Belmont and ends up horse of the year. Not just a good horse, but horse of the year. All So on what we're talking about here, you just got to keep trying with them. We're getting paid to try this and that, and every once in a while one will really surprise you. One thing that Wayne himself has overcome in the last couple of years, you battled COVID, multiple Big back time. surgeries, mm -hmm. and a little hiccup this meet when he broke five ribs in a riding accident. Now, I didn't fall off. <laughs> 
I don't fall off. But I ride every morning. I ride really nice horses. I, I, got, I bought a new one, and I was getting ready to send it to Lori up there in Colorado. We have a little ranch up there in Colorado where we uh, have Lori teaches, and we show some horses and so forth. And I stepped out, and they had saddled the wrong horse. They saddled him. So I, ah, I'll ride him. So he got bumped and he jumped forward. And I had the long spurs on, so to catch myself, I caught him with my spurs. The next jump was about from here to you guys. The next jump was even another one. Now I, I didn't ride him the eight seconds. I didn't get anything <laughs> for it. I, I lasted seven and I didn't have any style points because boy, right at that point, he dumped me and it flipped me right over. It broke all the ribs of my back. So, but I'm getting better now. They said I shouldn't ride for two months. And Lori said to me, how are we gonna handle that? I said, well, we'll change doctors. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt that Wayne is one of the most recognizable names and faces in all of sports, not just horse racing. Four-time Eclipse Award winner for Outstanding Trainer. He's only won the Kentucky Derby four times. Did it once with a filly in 1988 with winning colors. Six Preakness wins, four Belmonts, and those 14 Triple Crown races, 11 different horses. It's like a potluck. Yeah, you know, I often wondered, uh, is it harder to win the Triple Crown with two or three different horses? Or is it easier to do it like Bob, my good friend Bob Baffert did it with the American Pharaoh, you know, sweep it or justify those horses? I, I wonder about that. Uh, when you get one that's so dominant, that is, you know, really good, um, and you get them in a, a class by that, I mean a year that they're all three, sometimes I think it's easier to sweep it than it is to probably develop three of them. I don't know. I'm kind of curious about that. <clears throat> I'm still looking for that one. <clears throat> <laughs> now, Wayne actually started out as a basketball coach. So when we reference Wayne as the coach, it actually has literal meaning. How many of you knew that Wayne was an actual coach? Several of you. So what have you used from your coaching days to transition over to being the trainer that you are? I think that probably the biggest thing we brought to the table was organization in a lot of ways. We, got, we grew very fast. When I left the quarter horses, we grew in the thoroughbred business. We started to win and we grew real fast. Well now, we, there was no way that we could actually be hands on with that many horses, meaning me. And uh, so my theory was that every one of those uh, owners would not, they, you're not going to get a good one for every one of them. But that means that what do you do with the ones that are a little bit less? So we decided we'd try to make every horse very useful. And we are very proud of over the years, all of our clientele, almost all of them have been in the black. The only ones that aren't in the black are the ones that, you know, get that uh, caught up in that uh, black beauty syndrome where they, you know, can't let go and we, we can't manage them. But we've been in the black. But in order to do that, we found out that they weren't going to all win at Santa Anita, so we sent some to Bay Meadows up in Northern California. We found out they weren't going to all win at uh, Belmont, so we sent a division to Monmouth Park. And we started dividing those divisions up. And that came from my coaching background. We got the defensive coordinator, the offensive coordinator, the backfield coach, and so forth. So I, I developed a young set of guys that had great uh, horsemanship and work ethic, and we started putting those divisions around the country, and pretty soon we made most of our horses useful. Almost all of them became useful rather than just pushing a couple in the back row and not really working with them. Well, that young set of guys became pretty useful as well. He has um, given the horse racing world some big names, and some of those big names are Hall of Famers or future Hall of Famers. I think that's yeah. being a little bit humble. Well, 
I chose really good young guys that had a great worth that could, I, they were going to be successful whether they met me or not. But maybe we'd give them a little push and show them some things that they wouldn't. Uh, this game is a game of experience. There's no how-to book. Nobody's teaching at all. I think it's because of the economics of it that there's so much money involved that uh, the guy that's training horses next year, he doesn't want to share anything. And back when I came in at around in the, the, the late, uh, the early 70s, 70, 71, 72, boy, nobody shared anything. In fact, if you were a new guy on the block, they didn't even say good morning. So nobody's teaching. And uh, so it's very hard for any young guy to get along if nobody's helping them out. They have to learn by trial and error, experience, and they're going to make a lot of mistakes. I made them. Every one of us on here on the backside of all made mistakes with horses. But after 70 years of doing it, you make less mistakes, I think, and you got a better chance to pass that on to these young guys. And I tried to do that in every case. I, every time we had a thing come up, I tried to explain why. And uh, with that came some really good ones. Well, those young guys that he's referencing, Todd Pletcher, Randy Bradshaw, Dallas Stewart, Mike Maker, who am I forgetting? Well, uh, uh, oh, you're forgetting a whole bunch of Well, them. there's a <laughs> slew of them. Karen, Karen, Karen McLaughlin. McLaughlin yeah. uh, George Weaver. Uh, I mean, there's, there's the list of them goes on. That are all doing very well. So Wayne also, as he referenced, started out in the quarter horse world uh, shortly after you were coaching. Um, Wayne is also the only individual that is in both the Thoroughbred Hall of Fame, which he was inducted in 1999, and then in the Quarter Horse Hall of Fame in 2007. And it was a couple of years ago, Wayne, that when we were talking, I asked, who was the fastest horse you ever trained? And I should not have been surprised when it was not a Thoroughbred. No, I think, I don't know if he's the fastest horse, but he was probably the best horse that I really would rank him up there, a horse called Dash for Cash. Dash for Cash came to me as a three-year-old, and he run in nothing but grade one, as we call it now, stakes, nothing but the best races that you could put him in, and he, I never lost with him. I, he won every time, and I got so confident that... Uh, I, I really got cocky about that one. I just uh, <laughs> told the guys, enter up and see how you get along here, because he was unbelievable. And then as the study changed the whole third, or the quarter horse game, he became such a dominant sire also. But he, he would rank right up there with, of our, we've had, uh, I don't want this to sound bad or boastful, but we've had, um, 49 world champions, I think, in two breeds. Holy and, cow. Uh, yeah. That, that, and no, I'd boast too. That's impressive. <laughs> well, you should. Of those, it's hard to say one was better than the other. You get into an era where, you know, maybe uh, Lady Secret was the best one you ever had when she was running, when she won 11 grade ones. And then you, you go along and Serena Song, maybe it was her era and so forth. So it's hard to say which was the best horse she ever trained because it, it might be when they were with that group at that time in their life. So obviously throughout your decades of training, there's one thing about horse racing, there's going to be highs and there's going to be lows. What is the one thing that has steadily motivated you throughout the years? Uh, Do a little this shimmy. is probably Bill Gates, I probably <laughs> should take it. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> I would say that the, the thing that I like to play at the top, yeah, I like to, I, I get really motivated on the better races. Right off the bat, when we first started uh, 
over the thoroughbreds. I thought right away we earmarked the Triple Crown races and the Breeders' Cup races and said, these are the ones that change everything. These are the ones that draw attention to your barn. These are the ones that these races will, you know, get you where you want to go at the top. So we put great emphasis on I I look forward to the, even if I'm not too effective, I, I like uh, the Arkansas Derby coming up, I, I'm probably stretching a little bit there, trying to get uh, a win there. We've had a great meet here by standards of the other horses, but I like to go. I like to go in the bigger ones. That's what gets me up and gets me going. Well, that's a great segue as Wayne's allowance win just this past Thursday with a horse by the name of Major Blue was his 15th win at the meeting and I'm going to say you are on target to close out the meet just as strongly as you have started last Samurai's Essex win uh, the last Saturday was Wayne's 350th 350th Oaklawn win did you know that no now you do last Samurai we keep score we keep score in a different column it's got a dollar sign. That's how we <laughs> he's adding to yeah, that 290 yeah. million yeah, is what I, he's when, doing. <laughs> those wins are fine, but uh, that, that far right one, that column's where you want to get going. Now, Last Samurai is looking to defend his title in the Oaklawn Handicap next out. And kind of looking at his past performances and his record, Wayne, He's kind of like really good wine. The older he gets, he really does seem to be coming into himself. Tell us how he came out of the Essex and, and what your expectations are for the Oakland handicap. Well, he's improved since he got here quite a bit. We, um, we, we went in the first two of legs. One thing about Oakland is they really do a good job of setting up these stakes. Like for an older horse, he's got a three race series. Mm -hmm. The three-year-olds have got a four-race series that you can get into, and, and that really helps if you're training horses. He's got two of them now. He's really getting his act together, and uh, he's got a chance to sweep the, those three races, which would be very significant. So it's interesting that Wayne was my guest last year uh, prior to the draw for the Arkansas Derby, and he had decided to run secret oath uh, against the boys and after her win in the Honeybee, and she certainly held her own. She was third in the Arkansas Derby uh, before going on to win the Kentucky Oaks, and she was then fourth in the Preakness. And she returned to the winner's circle right here. She loves Oaklawn Park. A lot of your horses really love Oaklawn Park. I think it's the water. I'm just going to say that. Um, she was a dominating performance in the Azari, uh, beating favorite Clarier. Now, she is now, as you said in the post-race interview, Apple Blossom bound on the, just right on the verge of $2 million in earnings. Tell us how she's doing. Well, she's, she's really matured uh, beautifully. Uh, she, she was last year a, a real rangy, big, raw bone filly. We didn't have a lot of flesh on her, and uh, I pushed her along pretty hard. I probably, in hindsight, could have skipped a couple of those. But she now has filled out. We gave her a little break, and she's now filled out and really gotten her act together, and her stride and everything is much, much stronger. She's... Uh, She's absolutely got her act together. I, we're, we're looking forward to the apple blossom. We're open to the world. I love that, that quiet confidence. One thing I love about Secret Oath is the ties with the dam, the breeder, and if memory serves, Wayne, the same groom that rubbed Secret Oath rubbed absent-minded. Yes, that's right. The dam, the dam found herself here when she was uh, four. She didn't look good till she was four. Now here comes Secret Oath, and she's definitely better at four than she was at three. So it's fallen. It, but that that whole pedigree indicates that too. The groom's a good one. They, we don't. It's uh, it's not a democracy in our barn. If they're good, they get the good ones. If they're not real good, they get 
lesser horses, so I wouldn't say bad ones, but... I was going to say, do you have lesser horses? <laughs> well, we got them. <laughs> you bet we got them. We've lost seven of them in the claim box. We don't claim, but uh, we... Uh, we made room for our two-year-olds that are coming now. They'll come all, all our two-year-olds will pick up and probably around the end of April now. And we're pretty excited about them. So Tyler Gaffleone gave a very impressive ride on Secret Oath in the Azari. Will he be back for the Apple Blossom? Yes. Oh, that's yeah. great. That's was, really good he news. He had a conflict and he was really bothered by it. He was trying to make up his mind how he could ride uh, and her and save the other mount. It's a grass filly that he had great luck with last year, but he finally worked it out, and he's going to ride uh, Secret Oath. So we will draw tomorrow for the $1.25 million Arkansas Derby. Uh, Bourbon Bash, who was fifth in the Rebel, is pointing towards that running. And I've heard some rumblings, maybe, about Major Blue as he would make the stakes debut and stretch back out to uh, after a sprint allowance win. Tell us your thoughts about the Arkansas Derby. Well, that that would be the one that we'd like to win, if, and I don't downplay the others. But we, um, the Major Blue is getting good right at the right time. He's really coming on. He's got a pedigree, a style, and uh, he, he showed a brilliance the other day when he won. I put him in the five and a half only to give him experience. I told David uh, Cabrera in the paddock, I said, just break, let him catch a little dirt in his face. Uh, rate him a little bit and then give him a chance to finish up the last eighth of a mile. The gate opened, he went wire to wire and run unbelievable <laughs> fractions. It was so very impressive. He, he really was impressive. But by the way, he's named after my grandson, who's a major in the Air Force. That they talk about the long blue line, and so I named him Major Blue. He's a major. He was a mission coordinator for Air Force One, so he's got his career going pretty good too. Yeah, he. It, I'd say so. That's an understatement, Wayne. You can definitely brag about that. I, I'm so proud of him. I'd like to see this horse get along. I'm going to run this horse in the Bluegrass Stakes, so. Oh, you are. Yeah, I think so. I'm, okay. I'm going to give him. I'm going to give him the extra week which would be, that one's on April 8th. I, I like wheeling back in eight, 10 days, so I've, uh, if you recall. I do. I got a Philly beat here a few years ago, and I wheeled her back in one week, and she won the Arkansas Derby. Only Philly to ever 1984, win 1984, Althea. Yeah, Althea. I don't say I would do that every time, but I would have wheeled him back, except that I think the bluegrass might be a better fit for him. I'll run, I'm going to run Bourbon Bash in the Arkansas Derby, and he's got to step up. He's got to improve. So, you know, we are going to be doing the draw live tomorrow right in the winner's circle. Okay. You have a personal invitation from, from me. Thank you. Okay. I never go to the draw because it, you have no control over it anyhow. So, ideally, <laughs> looking, say, between a 10-12 horse field, what's the ideal post position? Or does it even matter? It really matters here. <laughs> okay. It really matters. You get it. You get 10, 11, 12, 13. You get outside here, and going two turns a mile and a sixteenth. It really matters. I don't know what the percentage is, but they hit this turn, and it is won and lost right there. I always tell my riders when they just ride any race going two turns here, I say the race is won and lost right in front of the hotel. Interesting. So when you get to the hotel, you make a decision. And they may not have an option of doing what we'd like to do, but I always tell them do not make a move on that turn over there at all. Wherever you end up in going into that turn, commit to it. Sit still, hold your position, and try to get in a position to win the race down the backside and on the far turn. I tell them that ho right in front of the hotel, you win or lose them right there. And if you're in the 11, 12, 13 hole, boy, you better have the best horse. That, when, you, when you draw that, it just makes you sick. 
My office is now very close to the paddock, and I've had the honor of Wayne and Lori hanging out on several different occasions when Wayne's had a very busy day. Um, and it is definitely quite the sight to see them cheer on their runners uh, throughout the afternoons. And not that long ago, Wayne noticed a print of a very near and dear friend who is now past Hall of Fame trainer Jack Van Berg. And Wayne told a very interesting story. Wayne's always good for stories, by the way. And told a very funny story about when you two were actually very good friends. Yes, Jack and I were real close. And we'd sit out there on our ponies uh, in training in the morning. And one of my... Let me shut Bill Gates up. again, he just won't let up. No, I didn't. I, I tell him not to call me at this time. But. <laughs> it's Warren Buffett this time. <laughs> By the way, I know Warren Buffett. <laughs> Why am I? <laughs> exactly. Of course he does. <laughs> I, did, um, I did a corporate speech for Bill Gates in the Omni at Atlanta. 1,700 executives from all over the world. Uh, believe it or not, he hired me to give the keynote uh, luncheon speech, and you'd wonder what the hell of a horse trainer could. A kill. lot. What would they were sitting there and looking around when I was being introduced, and and I could just read. And I said, to, I said to him, I was sitting with him on the dais, and I said, this is going to be rough. And he said, don't worry about it. I heard you when you did American Express, which he did, I guess. But I knew it was going to be tough, so I went to the podium, and they, they were sitting there like this, tip back, and I said, sit up and get your back straight and get up in those chairs because we're going to do some things today. <laughs> they all jumped up. I told you, E.F. Hutton, <laughs> did I not? Yeah. yeah. But anyhow, back to Jack. We're riding, holding our, riding our horses out there, and, and uh, one of my nice fillies would go by, and I'd say, Jack, this filly is a half-sister to two grade ones and her mother is a grade two winner. And we'd sit there a little longer and I'd say, now this Colt, Jack, look at this Colt, how do you like him? He's a, a full brother to two grade ones. A little while later, Jack would have one go by and he'd say, Wayne, see this one, this filly of mine here? She's a sister to three maidens. <laughs> And that's pure Jack Van Berg humor as well, yeah. Mr. Mr. Ice with w yeah. Ice with wine. A lot of we rep flew on an airplane from Saratoga together, and the guy next to me uh, ended up buying a horse. Like by the time we by the time we got to L.A., we flew from Saratoga to L.A. in first class. I talked Jack in the first class. He was in coach, and I had he to, was not. Believe me, Jack would never pony up for yeah, first class. So I I got him up there. And believe it or not, you can't make this up. The guy sitting next to him had some forgot his credit cards or his wallet or something, had to borrow fifty dollars from Jack to get home. <laughs> he said, You get That's a client and Jack uh, Jack's yeah, out fifty said, bucks. You, you get a new one and I, I end up lending him. Uh, sadly, a lot of very, very reputable trainers over time begin to lose clientele because there are major ebbs and flows in horse racing. Their stable numbers start to dwindle, but that has not happened with Wayne Lucas. When I was talking to Lori this morning, she says, this is the revival. What does it mean, Wayne, to have really not slowed down? Well, what had happened in, in our uh, business is that my four key clients, the four people that were with me, you know, 20, 25 years, they passed away. I lost them in about a span of about two years. And uh, Bill Young, Bob Lewis, uh, Gene Klein of the Chargers, those are very difficult people to replace. So we have built our whole program on buying young horses in the yearling market. That's, that's where we try to, you can liken it to the NFL draft. We, we try to get a good yearling. We think that we uh, have got it down to where we can recognize a good one from a bad one. And so we, we try to get in that yearling market, but that takes serious commitment from an owner. They, they have to step up. And we um, ended up 
having a couple of cattlemen that I met in Texas, I took them to the Derby a couple, oh, six, seven years ago, and all of a sudden, out of the blue, they called up and they said, we're ready. And they said, we're ready to step in. And boy, did they ever. I mean, last year in the yearling market, we spent $9 million. So get ready. We will be back in the next two years. We got an unbelievably good set of yearlings, maybe as good as we've ever bought. Really strong. So right, the right pedigrees, the right dams, good individuals, and we're getting rave reviews. They're all down in Ocala right now, but we're getting real strong reviews on them. So it literally is that revival. It's that at eighty-seven, it's a resurgence. Well, we weren't too far away. <laughs> <laughs> no, you never were. Uh, no. You never were. But, I mean, yeah. what, is it, what does it feel like to have that caliber of stock to still coming up? I really need it in order to get, I, I think it's the thing that stimulates you. You're going to get up every day if you've got those kind of yearlings coming. You, they'll, they'll get you out of bed. I get up at 3 o'clock every day, and... Uh, I, uh, I think it's just a tremendous motivation to know that you got those kind of horses in the barn. If I had a bunch of claimers, and I'm not knocking the claiming base, but if I had to look at the same horses year in and year out, or I think, that, I, think I would still train horses, but I wouldn't enjoy it as much as I would developing some of these we're developing like Secret Oath. You've come to Oaklawn for years. Wayne, what is it about Oaklawn that, that makes this track in Hot Springs, Arkansas, so special? Well, the, the fan base, without a doubt, is better here than any place in the country. The one thing that's different here is that, that ownership likes horse racing. These, uh, that casino there is kicking it out in big in big numbers, but you still you still got to have ownership that likes horse racing and is trying to promote it and help it. The people in Arkansas love it. We last Saturday, I'll, I would venture to say we had more people here on Saturday than they had at uh, New York, at Belmont, and Santa Anita combined. I'll bet you we had more people here at the races. The uh, the thing about the casinos, they're helping racing on the purses, but it's just a matter of time until those casino guys say, you know, those horses are expensive to keep up and maintain that racetrack and the barn and everything. They're, they become a pain in the ass. I'd rather just vacuum the, uh, the carpet at 2 a.m. and keep right on opening the casino. So you got to be careful the casino doesn't push out horse racing like it has at a lot of places already. That's, that's a big danger. That won't happen here with Lewis Sell, I don't think. He's totally committed. You guys make it, though. He, how could he be committed or change his mind about anything about horse racing when you get 40,000 people coming here on a given Saturday? It, uh, it's just, I feel it. I, the fan base on uh, walking around through the grandstand uh, is certainly stronger here. Maybe Derby Week, a little bit like that, but that's it. Other than that, it's nothing like here. They, they like it here, and they like the trainers. They like the riders. It's, the atmosphere here is everything, and a good purse structure. We still got to make a living, so we love these large purses, and they're going up. And they'll continue to go up. Horse racing is full of tradition, and there is a Lucas tradition that he has had for years, and it is taking a child, which is developing a new fan base, into the winner's circle. And you have continued to do that for decades. Tell everybody how that came about, well, Wayne. Well, <clears throat> about 40 40 years ago or so, I, um, I, I started winning a few races, and I, I just go through the crowd, and I'd catch her right there, that little one right there. By the way, we're in the 11th race today, hon, and if you're here, 
you be sure and get right over here by the gate, and I'll come and get you, and we'll go down. And I Personal think, invitation I think from I Wayne Lucas. The, I think I can win the 11th race today, by the way, so you got an invite to come to the winner circle. But that's what I would do. I'd just go up, and I'd tell the parents, don't worry, I'll bring them back. And the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, I'm not a I'd child just take them to the winner circle. And then I told the photographer, whenever I've got a small child in the winner circle, one, two, or whatever, uh, they can go now with digital photography. They can go in about 10 minutes and get the copy of the of the picture, and I would sign it if they can, you know, catch me later. So I, it's always on me. So that has become really something. You know what's amazing? You know, I've talked to my colleagues and good friends, and I can't get them to do it. But you've it's also amazing. gotten letters. Oh, oh boy. Decades later from these small who were, were once small children that he has taken into the winter circle and how much it meant to them. I and get, they have now taken their children to the racetrack. That happened last week. Guy, uh, he brought uh, a guy said, you took me when I was nine. And he said, this guy right here, seven. Now, would you, you know, is his son. He said, it would go another generation. So I took him in the winter circle. But uh, the um, the whole thing is you get you get such a feedback. It is so gratifying and so it's it's probably the one thing I do that that uh, makes me feel good about going to the winter circle more than anything else. I had a little guy the other day and I said, hey, I said, uh, did you bet on this horse? He said, nope. He said, I said, who'd you bet on? He said, the one that ran second. <laughs> and I said, uh, does your mom? Uh, like it when you and your dad come to the races? And he said, not every day. <laughs> 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 Evidently, they're coming every day. But uh, I've got a nine-year-old at uh, L'Oreal. We got a nine-year-old formed a fan club, didn't he? Yeah, really? He, he, we you got, got a nine-year-old uh, to form a fan club? Yeah. He, uh, it's probably the he 18th wrote, fan club. He wrote club. us a, a letter. You, you couldn't believe it. It was... He wrote us a letter and said how he formed it. He said, I'm president, and the other kid in this class is vice president. <laughs> and he said, we have nine members already, and we're growing. And he wrote this letter. That's awesome. <laughs> so we sent him everything. We sent him pictures and shirts and everything we could think of. One thing I referenced earlier was Wayne's book, Sermon on the Mount, which is full of Wayne-isms, as I like to call them. Um, but one of the quotes in the book that has really stuck with me is, faith is not about everything turning out okay. Faith is about being okay no matter how things turn out. And every time, sorry, every time I'm around you, Wayne, Oh, you're I kind. know everything's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. It always is. I, I, I always tell Lori, my wife, we, something goes a little bit astray with the horses or other things, and I say, look, we're not saving lives here. We're just trying <laughs> to get horses to go left around the turn. Don't, uh, don't worry about it. It's going to be just fine. I, um, I really believe that uh, the most important decision you make is – your attitude early in the morning. What you determine your day is going to be, your attitude and that adjustment, make that adjustment and make it damn early and uh, carry it through the day. And that, I think, is the most important decision you make on any given day. I have the utmost respect for this gentleman. As i got to make her my press agent. <laughs> 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 so thank you for not only what you have done for the industry, but thank you for being an amazing human being. Oh, thanks. I, uh, thank you. I enjoy this so much. I love sharing it with you. And uh, it's, uh, I think we should do more of this. I always say that if you like the game, you know, it's interesting. Almost every one of you probably have a story that the first time you came to the races, somebody brought you. You came with a friend. Somebody said, we're going to the races, and, and you take a friend. That's how we grow. I, don't, I think uh, television helps a little bit, but we don't have the exposure that probably football or the rest of them have. But if you just take a friend every once in a while and introduce them, they'll be locked in, especially if they win a little bit. Hook, line, and sinker. You're not kidding. Now, what, 
we got this girl locked in today. She's got her notebook out. She's taking notes. She's ready to go. She's ready to get that autograph. For the last time, please give it up for the living legend, Wayne Lucas. Oh, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you.